Very good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming here uh, very early uh, this morning for uh, some of you. Um, and I'd just like to extend a very warm welcome um, to Admiral John Richardson, who is going to um, be our speaker this morning. Um, Admiral Richardson uh, graduated from the US Naval Academy in 1982 with a Bachelor of Science in Physics. Uh, he holds a master's degree um, in electronic, uh, electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and a national security strategy from the N National War College. Um, at sea, Admiral Richardson served on the USS Parche, uh, USS George C. Marshall, and USS Salt Lake City, and he can commanded USS Honolulu in Pearl Harbor um, in Hawaii. Uh, for those of you who are interested, um, those vessels um, are submarines, so um, Admiral Richardson, Richardson is a submariner. Um, the Admiral also served as Commodore of Submarine Development Squadron um, 12, Commander Submarine Group 8, um, Commander of uh, Submarine Allied Forces South, Deputy Commander US 6th Fleet, uh, Chief of Staff US Naval Forces Europe and US Naval Forces Africa and also Commander Naval Submarine Forces and Director of Naval Reactors. Uh, his staff assignments include duty in the Attack Submarine Division on the uh, Chief of Naval Operations Staff, Naval Aid to the President, Prospective Commanding Officer, Instructor for the Commander, Submarine Forces, US Pacific Fleet, Assistant Direc uh, Deputy Director for Regional Operations on the Joint Staff and Director of Strategy and Policy at US Joint Forces Command. The Admiral also served on teams that have been awarded the Presidential uh, Unit Citation, the Joint Meritorious Unit Award, the Navy Unit Commendation, and the Navy E Ribbon. He was awarded the Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for his time in command of USS Honolulu. And the Admiral began serving as the 31st Chief of Naval Operations from September 2015. So it's a very illustrious um, CV. Um, thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. This is, uh, this is the time for thunderous applause, right? Uh, <laughs> no, well, thank you uh, so much for that very kind introduction. It's, it tends to be a bit technical, though, don't you think? It sounds, uh, I started to feel like this guy over here <laughs> after reading it, sort of just want to go back to bed. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining me in, in a magnificent hall here. Uh, and I think I have to, my, my natural tendency is to wander around, but I think for the media or something, I have to stay here. Is that uh, right for the, for the microphones? Uh, but I do want to uh, just thank everybody uh, uh, here at uh, King's College, the faculty, uh, Professor Bowen, uh, Dr. Padalano. Uh, and I thought that we could spend some time today quickly going through how I see the maritime environment uh, and then uh, try and finish up my talk in about half the time that we have together and then open it up for questions if that's a, a fair set of rules of engagement. Uh, what I'd like to do is highlight the fun, you know, a, a critical question that uh, faces us today, which is the question of maritime competition, particularly blue water competition. And so I'm going to, it's the, I, I'm going to, my thesis is that uh, we've not been in real competition for maritime superiority in uh, about 25 years. And uh, now as we sort of engage in this competition again for the first time in uh, over two decades, we have to be mindful that uh, not only the competitors have changed, and when we talk about competition, we're so often drawn to, you know, who's playing who, right? Who are the teams? Uh, but uh, in the 25 years since we've last done this, you know, the very rules of the competition, the character of the competition itself has changed. And so I'd like to talk about that. So we will talk a little bit about the competitors. We'll talk about how the U.S. Navy is responding to that challenge. And then some ideas about uh, uh, sort of the more nuanced challenges that faces us. And then uh, we'll open it up for questions after that, if that's a quick outline. So if this all works, We'll be in good shape. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, with very few assumptions. And I, one of the first challenges that we face as we move into this competition is that the, most of the people that I talk to have this view of the world. 
And uh, this work, uh, yeah. So all, uh, look how busy it is on the land, right? It's uh, all of the labels, all of the features, the, po the political part, the uh, roads, highways, railroads, uh, uh, rivers, valleys, streams, mountains, everything, the, you know, all of the politics centered on the land. Uh, the blue part that occupies 75% is really just a nice place to put labels, right? Uh, so they do label the oceans, and then when it gets particularly crowded on the land or a country or a feature is too small, the label will go out into the ocean, and uh, that's about it. That's how people uh, see the world in many ways. It's you know, their world around them is very land-centric. So I thought I'd start by describing how I see the world, which is much more like that, okay? And uh, this uh, land part uh, divided by uh, the oceans, or surrounded by the oceans. So first and foremost, you know, if you go back, we're gonna shift the perspective of the map so that we put Eurasia here, front and center, okay? And, uh, and then you can see from our perspective, the east coast of the United States over here, west coast over here, and you've got these two oceans that sort of separate uh, our, our nation from Eurasia. And we'll just start building the picture at sea over a series of uh, slides. Can you see the, the things in the back okay? All right, great. All right, so first and foremost, a very traditional thing, which is we'll just lay on the sea lines of communication, okay? Nothing super magic about this. Uh, it's about 4,000 years that uh, we've been you know, going to sea in some form or another. And um, so what you see here is the traditional lines of, uh, of transit. Uh, this is the super highways of trade. 90% of the world's trade travels on these maritime highways. And so extremely important for all of us. You get a sense these green dots are major ports around the, the world, and the size of the circle is proportional to the volume of business that that port does. And so we talk about a rebalance to the Pacific in, in the United States, and my goodness, you can see why, right? I mean, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, there's an awful lot rebalancing to the Pacific as these economies grow, and just look at the port volume that they're doing in terms of maritime trade. Uh, so, as I said, you know, millennium that we've been going to see, some of these uh, choke points that, through which this traffic travels have existed since that, the, the very beginning. Sort of the new folks on the block are the Panama Canal here, Suez Canal, but if you think about Gibraltar, Malacca, Hormuz, uh, Baba Mandeb, very busy recently, uh, some of these features which which shape this trade. It's, you know, if you go back to the earlier slides, one could be led to believe that it's all very homogeneous, but it's not, right? It's, there's structure. Structure is imposed by these choke points, structure is imposed by these ports, and so it's, uh, there is a, a structure here that can be, it, it prevents opportunities and, and uh, risks. Okay, but uh, so millennia since we've been going to sea and trading at sea, uh, however, in the last 25 years, the amount of traffic on the world's oceans has quadrupled, all right? Which is an astounding fact. If you think of thousands and thousands of years, there's been this steady buildup, but in the last quarter century, that amount of traffic on the world's oceans has increased by a factor of four, okay? This exponential shape that we'll be talking about in so many other areas and has driven the world economy, which has roughly doubled in that same amount of time. Global GDP up uh, you know, roughly by a factor of two, you know, 80% or so. So very, very important, very busy, uh, increasingly contested uh, and crowded at sea, even when we think about very traditional types of uh, uses of the ocean. Okay, but let's keep building. Uh, this is a depiction now, these Regions of purple are natural gas deposits. Uh, regions of light blue are uh, offshore uh, oil. And with the advances in technology, you know, many of these resources are now available 
uh, accessible for the first time. And this has been another explosion in the last 25 years, which has, you know, again, uh, made the maritime domain that much more important to the prosperity of so many people, so many nations. Uh, so there's this, this accessibility to resources here. In fact, uh, you're probably much more well-versed in this than I am, but even agriculture and now, you know, aquaculture uh, growing very, very quickly as people move offshore, you know, not only for natural resources like uh, minerals, oil, uh, those sorts of things, but also now farming offshore, right, uh, in, in, uh, in much more frequently, much more, much greater volume of our food comes from the ocean, and that trend also increasing. Uh, as well, you know, so these are the oil and gas deposits. These, these white diamond-shaped dots are just minerals that sort of along the seams of the tectonic plates, and those minerals also much more accept, uh, accessible with uh, robots, robots, remotely operated vehicles that can go down and get access to those types of things. So again, another dimension of busyness, if you will, at sea, and we'll keep building. Uh, the, the layer that just came on uh, points us up to the Arctic. And uh, in my 35 years in the Navy, uh, the Arctic, the North Pole, is as small as it's ever been. All right, and I think it's as small as it's ever been since we started taking measurements, you know, satellite measurements of the size of the polar ice cap. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean, right? Well, uh, certainly there are trade routes open, you know, sea lines open across the north uh, for, you know, on the factor of twice as often, right? Twice as much time you can take those routes uh, across the north of uh, Europe and Russia uh, even across the north of North America. And that has uh, strategic implications, not only from a security standpoint, but again, you save a lot of time if you want to take that route rather than going down through all of these choke points. And, uh, and so there's, a, again, a, uh, a commercial or a, uh, a prosperity dimension to that. As well, that's giving rise to, uh, well, it's giving rise to rising sea, t uh, sea levels, right? And so some of these nations in the Pacific really watching that very closely, right? They're, they're, they're not that high above sea level. And so, uh, you know, tremendous economic impact and social impact of the uh, rising sea level uh, that's brought about by the uh, melting ice cap. Okay, we'll keep building still. Uh, this is sort of a representation of the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations hotspots in the world. Okay, and so you can see that uh, one, they're right there in the middle of the map where we've chosen to put our center of gravity, and uh, they often overlay on uh, these choke points as well. So they are right there where trade must go through, right? So through the South China Sea, about 33% of the world's trade travels through that body of water. Through the Mediterranean and this sort of track through here, uh, about 25% of the world's trade travels through there. So extremely important from an economic standpoint and then traveling through those hot spots that have, uh, you know, continue to challenge the, uh, the security of those areas. And so um, when you think about, you know, where the U.S. Navy, where we want to be stationed, you know, this is where the challenge is. If we want to be out doing what the Navy does, uh, prospecting, uh, protecting our security and prosperity. These are the areas where it's most challenged, and as you see a little bit later on, uh, this is exactly where our attention is. Okay, um, so this idea of just sort of the classic maritime, things happening at sea, uh, very, very dynamic change in the last 25 years. So although we can think about, hey, let's just go to sea and, and get this competition on, maybe as we've done it 25 years ago, fundamentally different rules at sea, four times as crowded, access to resources, underwater infrastructure, uh, all of those things new to the competition since the last time we were really in a competitive environment. Uh, and there's more to it. Uh, we'll, we'll one more layer. So this might be difficult to see from the back. It overlays uh, closely with some of the sea lines, and it, but it's a little bit of a gold color, undersea cables, okay? And so this is a, a vast network of undersea uh, cables, uh, copper, fiber optic, 
on those cables rides 99% of the world's internet traffic, international traffic. Okay, this cannot be uh, recovered, right? It can't be picked up by any other thing. It, it rides on those cables. A uh, satellite constellation can maybe pick up 3% of that volume right now if uh, those cables were disrupted. So again, an extremely important part of the ocean. We talk about the internet, we talk about clouds, right? And clouds make you look up. Uh, the truth of the matter is it's a lake, okay? And all of that data, we should be looking to the ocean floor when we think about where that data resides, or at least where it travels. And so these uh, cables interconnecting, and the, the cables also giving rise to, so if this maritime, classic maritime force is different than it was 25 years ago, certainly there's another force out there, the force of the information world, which is completely new than it was uh, 25 years ago. And so it's given rise to, well, the whole cyber uh, element, right? Whether it's uh, cyber uh, business, security, cyber warfare, you name it. That's a new phenomena since uh, we last were competing at sea for uh, maritime superiority. It's accelerated everything we were just talking at breakfast, even politically, how fast this internet uh, changes things and uh, what a big impact it's had on, uh, on the political environment. It's the same with the security environment, giving rise to uh, cyber safety concerns, uh, personal information concerns, you know, the whole thing. And the speed and the reach and the precision, uh, the cost of entry for that world, uh, so low, right? Anybody with a laptop or even a smartphone can uh, be a global player if they're uh, clever enough uh, in this new information environment. Again, of an exponential type of shape, right? The amount of information in the world doubling about every two years. And so this is a, this, you know, brings on it a challenge in and of itself. How do we operate in that, that sea of information, right? And how do we make sense? Where do we find truth amongst the noise in that uh, is a, a challenge again. And so this information environment, uh, a second force that's uh, new since the last time we, we were competitive in this uh, maritime world. And then finally related to that is, a, uh, is the introduction of technology in the world right now. Related to information, there's an awful lot of information technology, but it's not just that, right? It's, uh, it's uh, genetic technology, it's additive manufacturing, right? If we can three-dimensionally print everything that we need or more and more of the things that we need, I will tell you from my standpoint, that changes logistics at sea a tremendous amount, right? Uh, and then uh, there's also artificial intelligence Right? There's a lot of investment to reaching an inflection point in artificial intelligence. Uh, the AlphaGo, you're all familiar with, this, uh, this algorithm that learned its way to beat the World Go Championship, a champion. Uh, and then uh, you know, what that means for autonomy, uh, unmanned platforms, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a, 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 a vast force moving in terms of technologies being introduced and not just introduced, but adapted faster. So take the telephone, for instance. When Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, uh, it took about 35 years for 25% of the population to get the phone, right, in the United States. A uh, smartphone, what do you think it was when uh, the iPhone came out? How long to get? Uh, it's about three years. Right, so, and you know that that iPhone brings you a whole lot more than that, uh, than that uh, Alexander Graham Bell machine gave you. So there's, a, again, an exponential dimension to the introduction of technology and what that means for us is, you know, th th it's, it's about pace, pace and complexity. And I guess my point is, is that, you know, we could have the strongest team on the field, player for player, but if we are not ready to compete at the pace of the game, we'll just be outscored, our defense will be out of position uh, over and over. And so there's this need to become more agile, which is a primary challenge for us in the U.S. Navy. Okay, so lots changed about the character of the game in the last 25 years, and if we're not mindful of that, we're just going to be non-competitive uh, no matter who are the competitors. 
Uh, but there are some interesting competitors out there. And so I just thought I'd step through those quickly here is a uh, depiction of land reclamation in the South China Sea. Okay, and so a rising, in fact, these two competitors, China and Russia, I would say are sort of competitors on a global scale, right? Uh, in, in just about every way you can slice it now. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a Russian jet aircraft. We were just talking at, again at breakfast, uh, you know, flying extremely close to the USS Donald Cook up in the Baltic. Uh, you know, I probably should have brought a, uh, a picture of the Kuznetsov as it uh, transited the English Channel, much more relevant here in the uh, United Kingdom. And so, you know, 25 years ago, these competitors were completely different. We had the Soviet Union back then was our last real competitor. Russia, a much different uh, competitor than the Soviet Union was. China, brand new onto the scene uh, when you compare to, your, uh, to 25 years ago. Okay, another group of uh, competitors, I would say, is uh, that competition posed by Iran and North Korea. Okay, not entirely as global as uh, China and Russia, but uh, truly another dimension of the competition as we just talked about is nothing's truly regional now, is it? Right, and so everything is at least trans-regional if not global. Every, uh, the, the, the dimensions of this competition are multi-domain, so we can't just wish away the fact that this is going to be a surface, subsurface, air, space, cyber, all coming at us at uh, one time. And so we've got to be able to move, command and control, operate in all of those dimensions at the same time. Uh, very, very challenging, even for competitors that uh, we would not, not too long ago have considered a very regional type of, a, of an actor. And then, of course, there is this pervasive persistent adaptive counterterrorism uh, threat uh, which continues to challenge us very greatly today. And so we, we, you've, you've uh, read about the four plus one, right? This is our, uh, just a representation of that four plus one broken into, I think, three you know, roughly uh, distinct groups. Okay, so what do we do? Well, this is uh, the mission of the United States Navy as we confront that competition, which has changed both in character and the competitors have changed as well. Uh, this is right out of U.S. code, right? Be ready to conduct prompt and sustained combat incident operations at sea, uh, certainly to protect America from attack, but also to preserve our strategic influence in key regions of the world, right? Nobody can be everywhere, but you've got to be where it counts, when it counts. Uh, trying to capture this idea that it really have to operate proficiently from the sea floor all the way up into space and into the information domain. Uh, I will tell you that uh, this deep water competition, competition in the deep water is something that's returned. Uh, you know, the idea of sea control isn't something we've had to think about for 25 years and we're uh, getting our, you know, a lot more water under the keel as we think about sea control in the 21st century. And then, of course, uh, our idea is to deter aggression, right? We want to be out there, we want to be the absolute best chief of, U.S. Chief of Naval Operations at not fighting anybody. And I think I do that by being so prepared that uh, everybody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, this is not the day to take that on, right? And so, idea is to deter aggression, enable peaceful resolution of conflicts, on terms that are acceptable not only to us but to our allies and partners with uh, which we, we uh, operate so often. Uh, but we've got to be very mindful that if that deterrence fails, uh, our, our mission is to conduct decisive operations to end any conflict uh, quickly and decisively. And uh, how are we going about that? We'll return to our picture of the globe uh, we've got uh, operations in the uh, Arabian Gulf right now, USS uh, Eisenhower and her strike group conducting uh, strike operations against ISIL in uh, Iraq and uh, Syria. Uh, again, uh, this is the uh, USS San Antonio uh, operating uh, helicopters uh, going against uh, uh, the, uh, in, in the conflict in uh, Libya. Right, so they're doing strike operations in CERT. Extremely important, uh, sometimes so effective at being 
you know, unseen and undetected uh, that they, we, they get forgotten, but uh, we constantly have five uh, uh, SSBNs at sea uh, providing that undersea leg of the strategic deterrent. And so uh, critical that uh, we, we maintain that capability. In the U.S. Navy, we are at a point, and in the uh, Royal Navy, at a point where we have to reconstitute that capability. And then uh, this is a, a picture of a, a destroyer, the USS John uh, McCain, uh, kind of operating in the Middle East. It's been very uh, active uh, down there off the coast of Yemen in the Strait of Baba Mandeb at the southern end of the Red Sea. In fact, that's where I'm headed right after this. We're going to get on the plane, fly to Djibouti, and I'll be visiting our teams uh, underway in the Red Sea just to uh, talk to them about how that missile attack went off the uh, coast of Yemen. And so uh, just going back, this is where the demand signal is for us, and this is where those forces are deployed. We have on any given day about it, within this circle of my uh, uh, that I'm depicting with the laser about uh, 100 ships of the U.S. Navy and about 65,000 U.S. sailors uh, four deployed away from home inside that circle, meeting these challenges, uh, progressing and ensuring, you know, peace and stability uh, in those hot spots. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so, you know, since the uh, end of the Civil War, really, uh, we've been a nation that's been looking beyond our shores to increase our prosperity. Right? We kind of started on the East Coast and the West Coast, worked our way in, but at about the mid-1800s, you know, we started turning out. And this gave rise to uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan and that, you know, a lot of naval strategists coming up in the latter half of the 1800s. Um, and the new dynamic now is that uh, we've got this push out as other nations now are turning outward, right? Uh, whether it's in their near abroad in uh, Eastern Europe, the Baltic, down through uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, or out here through the Ch South China Sea. I mean, this is something that I think nobody should be surprised about, right? Uh, sometimes I, you know, you just have to raise your eyebrow that folks are surprised that this is happening. Of course it's happening, right? It's happened to every prosperous nation. At some point, they're going to go beyond their shores, and uh, so you know, we should be ready for this, right? It's, it's not uh, too surprising. Uh, so what does it mean for us? You know, another, th uh, another mission. How do we deter that, that uh, conflict in, in meaningful ways? We'll go to the South China Sea here, and this is, you know, a depiction of those ar arrows as the uh, People's Republic of China looks to the sea now to enhance their prosperity. And uh, so how do you govern that uh, busyness? How do you govern that new maritime environment uh, short of conflict? And so we'll, uh, you know, certainly there's the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, right? And so this uh, depiction gives you a sense of the territorial seas. It might be difficult to see, but there's some red lines that depict you know, sort of the 12 mile limit, if you will. Out from three, right? Uh, if you're a, a scholar of UNCLOS, used to be three mile limit, out to 12, okay? Uh, as part of that uh, uh, convention. And so that's, I think, pretty much uh, easy for everybody to understand. And you just, there's rules of behavior when you're in another nation's territorial waters, but it's really just sort of an extension of their territory, and you've got to respect that. Uh, take a look at the same region of the world now when we start to consider exclusive economic zones. And uh, so, it, you know, again, a, a feature of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And uh, it starts to look a lot more crowded, right? And if you know, one uh, thing that we, uh, that I, I feel strongly we need to do is just sort of advocate, be present, and provide a stable force to advocate for behavior consistent with this rule set that has underpinned this prosperity for the last 70 years, really, since the end of World War II. And uh, even in this region of the world, you know, these economies, uh, many of them have grown remarkably under that rule set. And there is, you know, there are moves afoot to uh, take these exclusive economic zones, for instance, uh, which allow, a, you know, a fair degree of freedom of operation inside those. 
and make that rule set a bit more restrictive. Make, you know, move these EEZs more towards you know, the rule set that uh, you would apply towards territorial waters. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can see that a nation like Singapore, for instance, would have to go thousands of miles. They become essentially landlocked, if you will, uh, by virtue of you know, making these exclusive economic, the rules associated with the EEZs you know, overly restrictive. And so you know, finding just the right balance point, there was a, you know, a great give and take as they negotiated that uh, convention. Uh, finding that balance point, a, a rule set by which we can all abide, uh, I think is the key towards avoiding that Thucydides trap that uh, a lot of people have talked about, right? And uh, this will allow us, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity for everybody to grow still, I think, right? It's not uh, uh, a zero-sum game. Uh, and then uh, even when it does become competitive, we want to do so in a way that uh, avoids conflict at all possible costs. And so these, these rules and norms, I think, are the, uh, the path forward in that regard. And so I think that that is my last slide. I hope I've delivered on my promise to just give you my perspective. And uh, we've got a little bit of time left for questions, and I'm happy to open it up. Thanks very much for being here. It's remarkably early for an academic calendar, so I appreciate you waking up and joining me. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, I mean, I'll thank you very much for what was a very comprehensive and far-reaching talk, um, and very much uh, uh, up our alleys um, here at King's, where we strive very much to engage with these various questions. Um, I thought that the, uh, the, the, the looking at what is the meaning of the maritime domain, why does it matter to national security, was uh, central to the talk. Um, and it was interesting how you tried to touch upon traditional themes. The sea matters because of trade, because of resources in it, and, but also you added something new, um, connectivity, not just as a transport, but also as in information connectivity. So this, to me, seemed to be one of the emerging new themes that you were discussing, how even in the contemporary world, where we think that the most obvious things, such as the cloud, uh, drive us away from the sea, in fact, it's quite the opposite. They turn us even closer to the maritime domain, the way we know it. Um, and I think the other uh, component that I thought was extremely interesting is how you connected this to the return of competition at sea. Um, a couple of years ago, I was the Never were college, and I, I think I, I remember I used the expression, uh, contested the sea control is back. And it's been hubs and uh, for, for 25 years, this is the first time um, that, that this has been brought back into the discussion. So I very much appreciated the fact that you laid out a very clear context as to, based on these four core themes, trade, transport, energy resources, and, and connectivity, these are all sources where potential friction could emerge. Um, and you had clearly identified that this four plus one, four state actors, and, and I think the contested sea control is back, is part of this state act has been back at sea uh, in that sense, it identified two potential global actors, Russia and China, two more regional ones, North Korea and Iran, and of course one non-state problem uh, that is transnational in nature and that is connected to terrorism. Um, I think the, 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 the key element that I take away from this is how to manage, prevent things from escalating beyond the point of no return, and of course that brings in the key question of how do we govern this space that is complex, is multi-layered, and require us to have some shared principles and values? And, and the emphasis towards the end of the call, the, the, the talk, was really very much about how to accommodate what this evolving uh, a normative framework uh, that existed before UNCLOS, now with UNCLOS, and perhaps we're entering a stage where there are different uh, perceptions and understandings of UNCLOS. Absolutely. 
And so, and so I thought it was very interesting how, um, in this respect, um, you're trying to, to, to combine the traditional way of thinking about the maritime domain and, and sea power uh, as a competition at sea between sort of zero-sum uh, forces uh, uh, facing each other to one whereby that component still exists, but at the same time, there's a new component that is about exploiting the, the maritime domain as a, as a res communis, as a something that is we all have in common and whereby we can find by agreeing on the principles and rules ways to manage and, and, and keep conflict un, under control. You said it so much better than I did, didn't I? <laughs> That's what I meant to say. <laughs> so, but, uh, so, 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 without any further ado, what, I, what I'll do in the in the in the um, uh, convenience of time, um, we'll go back to 20 minutes. So I'll take three questions at a time, and then the Amber uh, will come back to you, um, Steve, and then the lady on 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 first one. Could you please introduce yourself, Steve? Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, of course. You also mentioned the opening of the Arctic, so it's possible that that could open a, a sea lane for uh, Russia. On the other hand, we've just seen the election of Donald Trump in America, um, and the risk is that <coughs> America becomes an inward-looking country. I would like to hear your point of view on how the dynamics at sea are going to change, um, given these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. It took a minute and 25 seconds before anyone mentioned the president-elect, so we're doing very well right now. <laughs> um, and Lucia at the back. And Lucy Norton, Department of War Studies. Thank you, Admiral, for an extremely illuminating talk. My question is, what does agility look like for the USN? Admiral, would you like? Okay, okay uh, each one of these questions would uh, to answer it properly would consume the remaining time, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, and I'll go in reverse order, I think, if uh, you'll allow me. Uh, with respect to agility, um, the way that we're dissecting that, if you will, is really in terms of everything that, that we do. And so if you read into this design for maintaining maritime superiority, it really describes an approach along four lines of effort. Uh, one line, uh, We've, we've coded them by color, right? So the blue line of effort talks about operations and war fighting at sea. And uh, <clears throat> what the vision is, is that, uh, well, again, it goes to this hybridity uh, or multi-domain type of, uh, of an approach where you've guess, just got to be, you know, if, if, we're, if you're the fleet commander, the conductor of an orchestra, your orchestra just tripled in size. You've just got that many more things to 
keep on the same uh, sheet of music. And so traditionally, you might want to think about physical movement of ships in the environment. Uh, now you've got to think about not only that, but that's got to be coordinated with movement in the electromagnetic spectrum, which is an inc increasingly uh, important part of, uh, of our business at sea. It's got to be coordinated with space maneuver. And so there's this space dimension as well. Uh, and so you can just see these layers starting to emerge. And uh, all of that has got to be re uh, much more responsive. Uh, and, and, and then as well as there is, in addition to electromagnetic, there, uh, there is this information environment that has to be coordinated. So that requires sort of a, a dexterity and a flexibility in operations, layers and complexity of command and control that we just have to continue to war game and ring out uh, how to respond at the speed of conflict uh, in, in those multiple domains. But it's not just that, right? Uh, it takes us forever. Uh, to design and build a new ship, for instance, right? It takes far too long. And so uh, we've got to become more agile in our acquisition processes to be able to deliver those types of new capabilities in a relevant time frame at a cost that's not prohibitive. Uh, with respect to our personnel system, how we recruit, uh, train, retain, you know, th that is the heart and soul of our success. And so we're spending a tremendous amount of time and investment uh, updating our personnel system into a 21st century system that allows us to better match each of our sailors' skills and priorities with the missions in the Navy. Uh, you know, we have, well, we just honored uh, Admiral Grace Hopper, one of the, you know, the founding uh, fathers, founding mothers of uh, computer science. And I think some of our personnel databases were coded by Admiral Hopper herself, you know, in the 1950s. Where the, it, it, so we just really have to overhaul that system to uh, get our, our people. The way we learn, uh, you know, there's been, again, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here. The way that we've, we, we've learned, a we've discovered a tremendous amount about how people learn. Right, and so how do we incorporate that so that our sailors, our recruits are learning as fast as we can, both as we inculcate and do that genetic engineering to make them all sailors, but also how do we learn on the job in a much more dynamic and agile fashion. And so it really spans all four lines of efforts, this agility question in terms of, uh, you know, just being able to do things not just quicker, but, you know, quicker with precision and effectiveness as well, so. Uh, with respect to the election, you know, my crystal ball says just don't talk about that. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, go past that to the uh, question about uh, hybridity. Um, the uh, uh, I think that even classic sea control, to, to get at the beginning of your question, has changed, right? And it is very much married to technology. And so I just wrote a piece recently on. Uh, uh, what I think about the term access, uh, what is anti-access area denial, A2AD. And uh, it just struck me that, well, one, it's not a term that, that's uh, very useful, I guess, at the end of the day. It's like going into the doctor and, you know, getting the, him telling you, hey, you know, you're sick. It's like, oh, I got that part. Uh, it's not very helpful. Uh, it's just too general to be uh, very useful. And uh, similarly, uh, it's not, a, a, again, like these nations moving out to the sea to enhance their security and prosperity, uh, you know, we should not be surprised at this trend of trying to reach longer with more precision, right? I mean, it's Agincourt, you know, all the way forward. Uh, so uh, it's nothing uh, really new, just the technology has changed. But it does change sea control uh, challenge when you can do that at a range that is now in the thousands of miles uh, with some, you know, pretty good precision in that kind of reconnaissance strike network. And what that network looks like is different depending upon which part of the world you're talking about, which is why I don't like the blanket term. Uh, but there is something to it, right? Uh, there's something, a substantial challenge that changes the nature of sea control. I think we would all agree that a 1,000 miles out from shore, that's blue water. Uh, and yet you can be challenged with uh, great precision from a shore-based system uh, with, with a ballistic missile. Um, and then there's the uh, challenge that you uh, highlighted, which is this hybrid nature and the increasing complexity of what I would call maritime security, 
right? It's not no, you know, in terms of the missions of the uh, of of a navy. Uh, sea control, in my mind, is just as you say it, our ability to control the seas, right? A coercive kind of classic uh, battle, if, if you will, if, if it comes to that. Uh, but these are sort of, you know, bending the rules, testing us up to the threshold, just short of a, of a, a kinetic response, if you will. And so this is, you know, when we said maritime security, even five, 10 years ago, uh, what we really meant was narco trafficking, you know, uh, trafficking in illicit uh, people, that type of a thing. Uh, now we're seeing maritime security mean something much more different. And I'll be honest, uh, it's highlighted in the design as something we've got to think about because it's uh, something we don't really have uh, a creative solution for right now. And this is just the maritime dimension of what we see in Crimea and Ukraine. I mean, these sorts of tactics are happening all over the world. And we've got to, I, I think that the answer has a lot to do with enhancing the strength of regional security structures. And so uh, it just makes them more resilient to these types of, of activities in and of themselves. You know? and, uh, and so we're spending a lot of time and effort working with partners, making sure that we're contributing in the most effective way together to regional security and uh, make those, those parts of the world, whether they're at sea or in land, a little more resilient to those types of hybrid activities. Um, I think, uh, conscious of the time, I'll probably take uh, two questions. The gentleman at the back and then here at the front. Sir. Hello, Jonathan Beale from uh, BBC News, Defence Correspondent. Um, a, a group of MPs, the Defence Select Committee and the Commons, recently published a report saying that um, the Royal Navy with 19 frigates and destroyers, that number was woefully low. I wondered if... Uh, you would concur with that view as, as, as our key ally. Um, and if you want to dodge the question, which I suspect you, you might, <laughs> so can, you just, <laughs> can you just tell us what you think is the minimum for a Navy to have as a credible force? <laughs> Okay, um, Bill, um, I should just point out that some marinos never dodge, they're just beneath the water, in fact, from below. Uh, so just to make things clear, um, Bill. Uh, Bill Hayden, Associate Fellow at Chatham House, occasional writer on the South China Sea. There was talk uh, earlier this year that the US Navy physically deterred China from building on the Scarborough Shoal and has maintained, in effect, a, a sentry duty ever since. I wonder if you could tell us anything about uh, the deterrence role that uh, you're undertaking in the South China Sea. Okay. So, yes. so uh, if you're asking any chief of Navy uh, if he wants more Navy, uh, is, I mean, it's a pretty easy quiz, right? <laughs> the answer is yes. And, uh, but as, uh, as I'm sure you know, and everybody, all, you know, all you, everybody in this room knows that the size of a Navy in a liberal democracy is not just up to the chief of Navy, right? And so it's interesting a lot of times how these conversations happen. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that any, you know, these, these ships take time to build. They have to be, you know, uh, approved. The funds have to be, uh, you know, set aside and applied uh, to these types of things. And so this isn't something that came on us as a surprise, uh, any of our navies, right? I can speak, I think, globally in that regard. Uh, but uh, I think it's much, you know, I just had dinner last night with the first Sea Lord. and. Uh, we spent an awful lot of time together as you know, very close partners, and we talked a, a bit about this. You know, a much different picture going forward, and I think a very optimistic times for the Royal Navy. Uh, and so, uh, again, also, you know, when it comes to this question of agility, right, absolutely key that uh, you can turn, you can see that just in the last five years, so much has changed in terms of the security environment and the demands and the responsibilities on the, that are placed on the Navy of a maritime nation. And I think this is uh, something that uh, the United States and the United Kingdom both share. Uh, to be able to respond to that is, is absolutely fundamental to uh, staying relevant as a Navy. And so if you've got a security environment that's changing on a, you know, a frequency of in, measured in single digits of years, but it takes you double digits of years to respond to that, 
uh, then again, that's a recipe for irrelevance. And I know that we're all looking to increase that agility so that we can be more responsive. The other thing is we've got to uh, you know, build these ships with as much flexibility uh, as we can, right? So that they can have a broad sense, uh, a, a broad spectrum of response. A, a lot of, uh, uh, words escaping me now, but flexibility in terms of meeting different challenges. Uh, one of the first things I had to do when I became the director of Naval Reactors was to give a speech to um, inactivate the USS Enterprise. Okay, so this is the very first nuclear power carrier uh, had been in commission for 51 years, you know, since 1960. And uh, just take a look at what has happened in our security environment in those 51 years, right? Uh, it had, well, she was built, and her first mission was to go down and serve uh, on duty in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then she was uh, at Yankee Station off of Vietnam. And when she finished her time, it had responded to a number of humanitarian crises around the world. And when she came uh, across the ocean and moored in Norfolk, she had just come from uh, Operation Enduring Freedom supporting uh, strikes in Afghanistan. And so you know, look at the, the change that had happened in those 51 years, and yet enterprise remained relevant for that entire time, right? The, the air wing adapted. Uh, they, there was enough space, weight, and power built into the ship that, that she was able to reconfigure uh, herself and remain relevant for those 51 years. Uh, similar going forward, right? Some things are just gonna be physics, right? The hull, the displacement, those sorts of things. But within those enduring pieces of a ship, we've got to allow for modularity and adaptation, uh, follow that, that technology curve that we spoke about. So there's, and, and, and the Royal Navy's, they're absolutely onto this uh, in every way. In fact, we're learning from them in many ways as to how to be uh, as, as uh, flexible as possible going forward. So I think the future is a, a very bright picture indeed. Um, and then the question here, I'm sorry, was... Uh, Scarborough shows. Oh, Scarborough shows, yeah. Did, uh, I, I will tell you that there, I, I'm a firm believer in uh, conventional deterrence, not just strategic, but also conventional deterrence. And you've got to be there and provide decision makers and partners with options, right? And so th that's really what it comes down to is that uh, you know, you're visible there, right? If you're not there, it's very hard to take credit for any kind of deterrence. Uh, and then you've got to provide uh, capabilities that, that allow options to unfold, right? And so this might be from, uh, those options may be some kind of a cooperative engagement or an exercise together for a partner uh, and certainly provide more coercive actions that would deter somebody to, from uh, you know, stirring something up. Uh, whether that uh, directly applies to Scarborough Show, very, very hard to uh, determine uh, you know, th this game theory. It's kind of infinite game theory now, isn't it, rather than finite game theory. And so uh, to say that anything with finality we deterred for now, hard to say, right? The game's still in play. And so uh, what I think is very important, though, is that we're down there, we're present, we're advocating for that uh, rule set, those norms of behaviors that uh, allow us all to compete uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily drive us to conflict. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, thank you very much. I think this brings uh, our proceedings to an end. Um, I think it was a, a remarkable uh, start of the day. We started exploring the challenges, new and old, to the Martin domain, and we ended up on a note that how we bring up to date traditional ideas about operating in the maritime domain in the 21st century. I mean, it's been a, a, a delight, a pleasure, um, and we wish you all the best for your next uh, uh, commitments. And also, happy Thanksgiving, right, which, if so I'm much. correct, is going to be very soon behind yeah, us. Yeah. Right, thank, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.